Hanoi, Vietnam, then and now. Half a century ago, I crossed enemy lines as a young American journalist and entered an altogether different world. It was the height of the Vietnam War, when my country was dropping more bombs on North Vietnam than it had in all of World War II. Yet for a rare moment in history, Hanoi was actually a more peaceful place than my own tormented homeland. It was in fact more tranquil than it is today. May of 1968, the Hanoi Spring. This is the story of two Hanois in very different eras as viewed through the eyes, cameras, and reflections of one man at both ends of a long life. The spring of 1968 was a tumultuous time in both American and world history. In the wake of Martin Luther King's assassination in April, America's inner cities burned in rage and despair. Meanwhile, TV and newspapers carried harrowing images of the carnage in Vietnam, where half a million American soldiers were engaged in the largest commitment of U.S. troops since the Korean War. Protests against the war drew hundreds of thousands to the streets of Manhattan. and to the very steps of the Pentagon. At the end of March, President Lyndon Johnson shocked the nation and the world by announcing that he wouldn't run for re-election and that he was ordering an immediate halt to bombing Hanoi to hasten negotiations with North Vietnam. I am taking the first step to de-escalate the conflict unilaterally and at once. Tonight, I have ordered our aircraft and our naval vessels to make no attacks on North Vietnam. The area in which we are stopping our attacks includes almost 90% of North Vietnam's population. I was a young journalist at the time, just out of college and working at a leading progressive think tank in the nation's capital. It was a heady moment. Those of us in the radical movement felt ourselves to be at the forefront of history, participants in events that would long be remembered. In April 1967, I joined half a million protesters marching down New York's Fifth Avenue. During the siege of the Pentagon in October of that year, thousands of us spent two days and nights facing bayonets and gingerly placing flowers in rifle barrels in the looming shadows of that massive fortress. Amid this rising storm, I received a clandestine invitation to travel to Hanoi, capital of North Vietnam, and epicenter of Vietnamese resistance to American intervention. While hundreds of thousands of American soldiers were heading south, a literal handful of anti-war journalists were heading north across enemy lines, none of them soldiers. It would be four more years before actress Jane Fonda would make her controversial visit. It wasn't clear whether it was illegal, but those of us who did were risking arrest and possible imprisonment by U.S. authorities if they ever found out. Yet it was too tempting to pass up. And as it turned out, my companions and I were simply too little known to be noticed. Traveling with three other young Americans, we first flew to Paris at precisely the moment when it was being gripped by a historic student rebellion. On we flew through Ceylon and Cambodia on commercial flights, 
then into Hanoi on an eight-passenger diplomatic courier plane. By night, the city was blacked out to darken potential bombing targets. It wasn't until dawn that we awoke to the sounds of music and the sight of old men doing Tai Chi exercises. The only other sound was the whir of bicycle wheels as cyclists pedaled in the near-empty streets. It was a stunningly tranquil scene to come upon after leaving behind the turmoil of a U.S. capital besieged by anti-war demonstrators. Hanoi, capital of an impoverished little-known nation in Southeast Asia, had become the improbable symbol of seemingly hopeless resistance to American hegemony. And yet it was Washington, D.C., seat of the mightiest war machine in world history, that was being torn apart by the conflict's moral and strategic contradictions, while residents of Hanoi savored a rare moment when the bombing of their city had temporarily ceased. We breathed deep relief, witnessing the stillness at the eye of the hurricane. Just as a repressed Czechoslovakia was enjoying its fleeting Prague Spring, May of 1968 marked Vietnam's Hanoi Spring. Neither, alas, was to last, and many more years of suffering would follow, before the war's end produced a lasting peace. In all, we spent two memorable weeks in North Vietnam. We stayed in the Hotel Metropole, the crown jewel of French Indochina when it was built in 1901. Now renamed the Tong Nhat, the Hotel Reunification, and outfitted with massive graceless furniture, its austerity seemed designed to remind one of the gravity of the war. It was a Noah's Ark of sorts, the sole hotel where foreign guests were housed in Hanoi. There were two or three of each nationality, Cubans, Chinese, Russians, French, Brits, Filipinos, and a smattering of American writers and journalists. Our guides, two men, Du and Nguyen, and a female translator, Nien, were unfailingly gracious and hospitable. The first week of our visit was consumed by meetings with officials and visits to museums cataloging American war crimes. There we gazed in horror at 500-pound cluster bombs, like those dropped on Vietnamese cities by American B-52s, and at dung-poisoned booby traps set by Vietnamese guerrillas. Our only free time was after lunch, when we were given a chance to rest in our rooms in the sweltering midday heat, and my colleague David played his recorder. I took advantage of these siestas to sneak past the front desk and out the door to roam the boulevards and alleys near Huan Kem Lake and capture candid photos of street life. There I found myself the object of curiosity as pedestrians gazed on me with bemused puzzlement. Young boys clustered around me, intrigued by my height and the hair on my arms. Ruski, they would call out to me since there were numerous Russians in Hanoi serving as military advisors. No, I would say, and shake my head. Amerikansky! The French Quarter was an almost sleepy neighborhood in wartime Hanoi. Kids lounged at the edge of one-person bomb shelters fashioned from vertical concrete cylinders.
Much of Hanoi's population had been dispersed to the countryside to protect residents from American bombs. Those select few who remained went about their affairs with an almost leisurely sense of time. Had I not known otherwise, I would never have guessed there was a war going on with Hanoi as its epicenter. Newspapers were posted on street-facing walls for public viewing, along with wartime propaganda depicting heroic soldiers defending the homeland. With no commercial advertising, there was blessedly little visual clutter to mar the simplicity of the scene. In the absence of cars, trucks and motorbikes, which were few and far between, the streets were as placid as a slow-moving river. At rush hour, one could have lain down on the pavement on a graciously wide boulevard in the French Quarter, and only cyclists would pass. After several days of being shuttled to offices and museums, our lead guide Du announced that we'd be leaving the next day for Taibin province, several dozen kilometers from Hanoi. In the morning we found not one, but two cars parked across the street from the Tongnat Hotel, old Russian Lattas that bore a distinct resemblance to 53 Chevys. We were driven into the countryside along hard-packed, one-lane dirt roads, riding past rice paddies and pedestrians, walking barefoot, carrying loads balanced on long poles. A few hours into our trip, do ask our driver to stop the car. This is Taibin City, he said. We stepped into high grass and listened to the silence in the heat of midday. I glanced in all directions, but could see no habitation, no shops, no vehicles, no people. I thought for a moment that I'd misunderstood what Du was telling us. Other than an occasional crumbling remnant of a wall, or an empty lane bordered by lush vegetation, it was a pastoral scene of graceful trees and grassy fields, with cattle grazing among the ruins. Most of what Du told me had until recently been a bustling textile center of 40,000 inhabitants now consisted of mere rubble, much of it no larger than a human foot. The Americans had pummeled Taibin with their B-52s starting in early 1966 and had continued to pulverize the debris long after the last resident had fled. Now a profusion of native plants had returned to bury all traces of the city's ever having been there. Standing in a field among birdsong and butterflies, I struggled to imagine the enormity of the crime. I was suddenly overcome by grief and anger towards the policies and politicians that would inflict such unjustifiable devastation. Yet for all my empathy for the Vietnamese, I was inescapably American, and as such wedded to the mixed blessings of my country's character and culture. I could live out a vicarious rebellion by imagining myself to be a freedom fighter in someone else's struggle, but it would be mere posturing. My situation was fundamentally different from theirs and required an altogether different response. Yet I also marveled at the resilience of nature in the face of such destruction. Today, Taibin City has a population of over 200,000, many times the size it was before its destruction, and few of its residents in the years leading up to its sudden extinction are around to tell their grandchildren what happened there. We visited a young woman's military training camp nested among rice fields. Despite its seriousness of purpose, it felt more like summer camp than boot camp. 
They genially competed with one another in contests to see who could swim across a river fastest with a pack strapped to her back and a rifle cradled in one arm. At one point, a phalanx of women who looked to be still in their teens lined up in formation with pith helmets and wooden sticks to simulate the rifles they didn't possess. Beside them, a cat crouched contentedly, apparently oblivious to military discipline. Much laughter accompanied their drills, a refreshing antidote to the regimented tone of military life. As if to reinforce their seriousness, we were finally shown an anti-aircraft battery where four women operated the controls. They wore suitably grim faces, but behind them I thought I detected secret smiles. Visiting an agricultural commune one afternoon, we joined briefly in the heavy lifting, despite the midday heat. In the manner of visiting diplomats, David hefted a few sodden clods of dirt from a rice paddy, while I watched enviously from the sidelines. We toured the village elementary school and watched a charming performance by local talent. Patriotic songs, no doubt. While parents, teachers, and classmates proudly looked on. we were suddenly surrounded by what seemed like every child in the village. They scampered alongside us, less than half our height, stumbling over makeshift dirt bomb shelters. They laughed and danced, coming close but never quite touching us. Several times I offered my hand. The boys stopped, clustered around it, and studied its impossibly large bone structure. I grasped one boy's hand in mine and shook it. Startled at first, he looked up at me as if to appraise my intentions, then returned my gesture with a harder grip. When we finished shaking hands, he trailed off and turned to the other boys, displaying his hand with stunned pride. As we pulled out of the village a few minutes later, he was still holding his arm, as if he'd just shaken hands with a space alien. The road leading back to Hanoi was a tree-lined lane, sometimes paved, sometimes dirt, that passed between rice paddies and fields of sweet potatoes. It was lined on both sides by canals with wading water buffalo. Three young girls in conical hats sat on high wooden benches, pedaling water wheels to circulate it through a network of canals surrounding the paddies. In the distance, improbably steep mountains sprung forth from the flat plain. Along the hard-packed one-lane road, bicycle traffic moved in both directions, laden with wicker baskets of food and supplies. Others walked, sometimes barefoot, carrying heavy loads with poles resting across the shoulder. Our drivers were having a field day blasting their horns to scatter pedestrians, cyclists, fowl, oxen, and wagons. It was starting to rain. Outside the car, the wind picked up dust and loose leaves and swirled them across the road. Women with handkerchiefs tied across their mouths scurried for cover, children in tow. Sitting in the back seat with Du, I asked him what it had been like during the French Indo-Chinese War, and whether the French had been as brutal as the Americans. He looked out the window with a distracted gaze. For the first time in the two weeks I'd known him, his expression grew severe. When he spoke, his voice was tinged with bitterness. The Americans have been far worse, he told me. They have every modern weapon, and they're using them all. They want to eliminate us as a people. The damage hasn't been simply material. We can repair those things in some years. It's not even most of all the loss of human life. It's the irreparable damage to the people, to the spirit of the people of Vietnam. We watched in silence as the rain swept across the rice paddies. Pedestrians and cyclists covered their heads to shield themselves. 
As the wind riffled through the rice grasses, I turned to Du and asked him a question. We were speaking in French, our one shared language. Might it be possible for me to stay on for a while in Vietnam? Du turned away from the window and gazed in my direction, his face softening into a bemused smile. Hmm, he said. What would you do here? I don't know, I replied. I hadn't really thought practically about what it would involve. Maybe, maybe I could teach English, I suggested gamely. He chuckled. I just hope we never have to learn it. Why do you want to stay longer, he asked. Because I'm so ashamed of what my people are doing to yours. Ah, he said. It was your first mistake. You can't change your own people till you first learn to love them. We lapsed into silence again as I struggled to understand what he just told me. It was so utterly unexpected coming from a Vietnamese. Here I had traveled deep into enemy territory, all the while expecting that someone, maybe in a phone booth or a secret meeting in a dimly lit parking garage, would hand me a message about how to subvert the American war effort. But it never happened. Instead, the message given to me to pass on to others in the struggle was to learn to love my own people. And this message was all the more powerful for coming from one who felt so strongly that my country was destroying the soul and spirit of his homeland. Sometimes when you hear or read something, some particle of insight that's beyond your comprehension, you must simply file it in the back of your mind and wait for your life experience to catch up with its wisdom. I placed it there to ripen into a fuller understanding of its truth. Nearly half a century elapsed before I returned to Hanoi, just a month after the 40th anniversary of the war's end in April 1975. Much changes anywhere in that span of time, but Hanoi more than most places. When we'd first arrived at night by courier flight to a darkened and almost deserted city in 1968, we found that Hanoi's Noi Bai Airport consisted of just two small vacant rooms, on our late-night arrival in 2015, by contrast, we're greeted by the spectacle of a vast, lavish, Japanese-built terminal open just six months with gleaming floors and expansive plazas centered around graceful fountains. A crisply uniformed custom agent pads about in his stocking feet. Our 1968 guide, Du, had expressed hope that his people would win the war and thus never have to learn English. His countrymen indeed won the war, but prominent airport ads now tempt travelers to love learning English. In 1968, we'd crossed the Red River into Hanoi on makeshift pontoons because the Long Bien Bridge had been repeatedly destroyed by American bombers. Now a stunning span of four soaring arcs crosses the river and a sleek palm-lined freeway links Noi Bai with downtown Hanoi. I've returned to Hanoi to find out what has changed and what endures half a century after my first visit. Clearly millions more people are on the move and on the make. But what, if anything, remains of a certain lightness of being that I noticed so long ago, even amid the war's harrowing uncertainties, an ability to live in and for the moment? Fifty years on, Americans are still deeply divided over the war's meaning and outcome. Our fractured politics and culture reflect its unhealed wounds. Do those wounds still fester for the Vietnamese, or have they somehow managed to move on? Nothing has changed more dramatically than Hanoi's traffic. A trickle of bicycles and ox carts has been replaced by an unrelenting torrent motorbikes, cars, trucks, buses, and pedestrians 
moving non-stop in all directions at once. This may be an authoritarian regime, but Vietnamese express their freedom in the streets not through protest, but through profligate anarchy. Few traffic signals are to be found anywhere, and still fewer cops. Why don't you have more traffic lights, I ask our hotel staff one day. They laugh and reply, no one would pay attention to them anyway. Crossing the street under such circumstances is a death-defying adventure. After watching locals stroll unconcernedly through traffic converging from several directions at once, my partner Joanne and I realize that the key to a safe crossing is to step slowly and steadily forward at a more or less predictable pace so traffic has a chance to accommodate your presence and trajectory. Buses pass a centimeter in front of your nose, motorbikes swipe your side, and cars bring up your behind. Think of it as traffic massage. One morning, I head off by myself and come to a street of torrid one-way traffic alongside the Red River. By now, I'm coming to believe I'm almost invincible. I strap a GoPro camera around my head and step into the manic traffic. Still, just for safety's sake, I decide to trail a local boy who seems to know what he's doing. He confidently wends his way between pedestrians and into the gauntlet of traffic. Suddenly, his mother appears, takes charge, and steps past him. It's like the party of the Red Sea. Ninety percent of the way across, I congratulate myself on being home free. Ow! What just hit me? Reeling from the blow, my gaze settles on a boy hunkered down on his motorbike. He scowls, refusing to look up. But the moment quickly passes, and he's on his way again. That, it seems, is Vietnam today. No rules, no rage. Harmonious anarchy extends to morning exercises around Huan Kem Le, located in the heart of Hanoi's atmospheric old quarter. Here, hundreds of locals rise early to beat the heat and devise unique personal routines to stretch their muscles in this most public of spaces. Sometimes they'll join with others and exercise to a one, two, three count. What? Hi, ba! Or dance to a melody blaring from a nearby portable stereo. No precision mass Chinese style calisthenics here in Hanoi. As a people that has successfully fought off their overbearing neighbor for several thousand years to maintain a fiercely independent culture, the Vietnamese demonstrate that independent streak in a cheerfully idiosyncratic individuality.
Back in 1968, American politicians invoked the so-called domino theory to justify American intervention, warning that if Vietnam fell, so would the rest of Southeast Asia. After Hanoi's victory, Laos and Cambodia did indeed follow suit. But today, like China, Vietnam has become a curious hybrid that some locals call Capcom, a robustly capitalist economy within a one-party communist state. So the dominoes ended up falling in the opposite direction. Just as the Vietnamese once welcomed American solidarity in their wartime struggle, now they welcome American investment. Strolling in an ancient pagoda on the old quarter's Huan Kem Lake, I come upon a shrine where someone has left a hundred dollar bill in the ashes where incense had recently burned. Is it an offering or an investment? In the half century since I last visited, the Tongnat Hotel where we stayed in 1968 has been restored to its former glory as the crown jewel of French Indochina. It's located in the French Quarter, also home to the Grand Opera, Stock Exchange, and Hilton Hotel, though not the Hanoi Hilton Prison, where John McCain and other American POWs were housed during the war. And who better to revive the Metropole's fortunes than Sofitel, the luxury French hotel chain? Except for its green shutters and grand façade, the once and future Metropole Hanoi is a world apart from the Spartan wartime Tong Nhat. Though if one looks carefully, one notices a striking continuity between then and now in the building across the street. The Metropole's interior is at once a celebration of colonial-era grandeur and a postmodern five-star resort. It's built around a swank bar, lounge, and pool, where well-heeled guests coolly appraise one another. Yet just off the lobby, one is quickly reminded of the Metropole's wartime history. Folk singer Joan Baez's penetrating gaze fixes on the visitor from a portrait in a display cabinet. She visited Hanoi on Christmas 1972 and returned in 2013. On her return trip, she brought with her fragments of bombs and other wartime memorabilia that had been given to her in 1972, as they were to us during our 1968 visit. Also displayed in the cabinet is a 1967 issue of Life magazine, featuring a photo essay with first-ever scenes of Hanoi under siege of U.S. bombing a year before our visit. And there's an award from UNESCO, for the management's rediscovery and refurbishment of the bomb shelter built under the hotel to safeguard its guests during the war. I confide to a young desk clerk that I stayed in the Tong Nhat in 1968 and took shelter in its underground bunker in the company of an illustrious assemblage of international literati. Her eyes opened wide. All this is ancient history to her yet for some reason all the more fascinating. She knows of the war only through stories told to her by her grandparents. She grabs a set of keys and leads us on a private tour of the shelter. When I return to the Metropole on our final day in Hanoi, I carry with me a few dozen of the original black and white photographs I took in 1968. I show them, curled with age, to the hotel's communications staff. These two are young women, And as for so many other young Vietnamese who've looked at these images, they elicit wonder and awe. The women seem to fall into a photographic reverie, as if, like Alice, they're entering a different world through a wormhole of time. I return for a 5 p.m. tour of what the Metropole calls its Path of History. Here I'm introduced to a dozen hotel guests. It's an international mix, mostly too young to have lived through the Vietnam War. The hotel's historian, Ba Kien, stands beside a portrait of a Vietnamese boy painted by Joan Baez while at the Metropole. 
She leads us through corridors off the main lobby, where wall displays recount the Metropole's illustrious history. The pre-war guest list includes actor Charlie Chaplin, author Graham Greene, who penned part of The Quiet American at a guest room desk, and a magisterial procession of presidents and prime ministers. An entire wall is dedicated to the American War. A plaque excerpts an account of an air raid from a journal kept by Filipina journalist Gemma Cruz Araneta. When she writes of being ushered into the bomb shelter with several, quote, American students and a New York writer, I check the date and realize she's speaking of our own contingent and of Susan Sontag, the glamorous and fiercely independent feminist intellectual whom I first met in the Metropole's bomb shelter. When I met Gemma in the hotel lounge, she was introduced as Miss International 1964, just a few steps from where her journal entry is today displayed. Now we've come to the most important part of the tour, Bakien announces. We're about to enter the bomb shelter that was unearthed and restored just a few years ago when workmen were excavating under the hotel to build the bamboo bar. She turns to me. Mr. Summer, please lead the way. She hands each of us a hard hat, and we descend into the dank, narrow passageway leading to a series of underground concrete bunkers. During air raids in 1968, we crowded onto narrow benches and folding chairs facing one another in this claustrophobic corridor. Twisting to the side to accommodate our long western frames, our knees nearly touched. We listened to the muffled sound of air raid sirens keening overhead, wondering if this time it was for real. Then someone broke the tension. I sure hope President Johnson wasn't just kidding when he announced back in March that he was going to stop bombing Hanoi. His quip elicited slightly nervous laughter. As the final part of the tour, Bakien plays a recording of Joan Baez, reciting a poem she wrote in this same bomb shelter when she and others took cover from renewed American bombing on Christmas 1972. We gathered in the lobby, celebrating Christmas Eve. The French, the Poles, the Indians, Cubans, the Vietnamese. The tiny tree our host picked sweet and familiar songs, but the most sacred of Christian prayers was shattered by the bombs. Afterwards, Bakien thumbs through the photographs I've brought with me from 1968. These are priceless, she says. We have nothing like this. We had no cameras during the war, so we had no way of recording what our lives were like. You should open a museum in Hanoi. Who would have imagined that an ancient military fortress would become a verdant oasis of serenity, splendor, and stillness in the frantic swirl of a city on the move. Hanoi's imperial citadel has been the seat of Vietnamese military power for more than a thousand years. Yet except for a solitary tower, a Soviet MiG-21, and an American F-111 jet fighter on display at the adjoining military museum, the citadel is a world away from war, part botanical garden, part archaeological museum. Treasures of great antiquity are on display and still being unearthed on its grounds. Bonsai plants line the walkway, leading to grand gates, pavilions, and carefully sculpted landscaping. But at the heart of it all, camouflaged by languid tropical vegetation, is an oddly stark and featureless building. It's the secret bunker, the Vietnamese Pentagon, where generals and civilian leaders met during the American War to plot strategy and direct operations on battlefields far to the south. In a plain, unadorned conference room, one finds the nameplates of legendary figures from that war. General Vo Nguyen Giap, who masterminded the Vietnamese victory, Pham Van Dong, who served as Prime Minister from 1954 to 1987, and Prime Minister Lee Duan, Premier and top decision-maker from the mid-60s till his death in 1986. On one wall of the conference room, 
A large hand-drawn map of Vietnam delineates battlefields. It's not even a whiteboard, let alone a video display. On a side table sit two black steel telephones, vintage U.S. 1920, that served as the military leadership's primary means of communication with units in the field. How, I wonder, did they ever defeat the world's dominant superpower equipped with such antiquated devices? And when they stepped out of the bunker to take a break, what effect must it have had on them to walk among elegant pagodas and lush vegetation once inhabited by their ancestors, who centuries earlier had planned strategies to repel Chinese and Mongol invaders? Hard as it must have been to wage a guerrilla war, it was nothing next to peace. As Premier Pham Van Dong told an American correspondent after the war, yes, we defeated the United States, but now we're plagued with problems. We don't have enough to eat. We're a poor, undeveloped nation. Waging war is simple, but running a country is difficult. Unlike most founders of authoritarian regimes, including Mao, Lenin, and Stalin, Ho Chi Minh was reputed to be a modest man. Uncle Ho, as he was fondly called by most North Vietnamese, chose not to live in a presidential palace, but in a small, screened, single-story dwelling mounted on stilts in the style of rural Vietnamese homes. He made clear during his later years that he wanted no big fuss to be made about him after his death, preferring simply to be cremated. But as a symbol of national unity, he was simply too useful to those who succeeded him to let him have his way. In the early 70s, a massive mausoleum was erected in the style of a grand architectural monument. There, Ho's body lies deep inside in a glass sarcophagus that preserves it for public viewing in perpetuity. Far more interesting, and one imagines more in the spirit of the man, is Ho's nearby sanctuary where he's said to have lived from 1958 until his death in 1969. Set by a tranquil lake amid trees and burnished yellow buildings, it peeks out from behind palms beside a small bridge from which visitors feed hungry koi swarming in the water below. Peering through the screens, you can see a dining room seating eight, a living room with a bent wood rocker, and a Spartan bedroom with a small desk and bedside lamp. The entire living space can't be more than 700 square feet, maybe less. Yet set as it is in a scene of such serenity, one is struck by the fact that Ho insisted on living in austere simplicity in the nurturing environment of a pond and garden, without any of the trappings of power his position had earned him. Amid the scene of national homage to a sacred icon, comic relief emerges in the form of a sign in both Vietnamese and English announcing, Garage of Ho Chi Minh's Used Cars. Stepping around the corner, I see what the sign actually has in mind. Three estimable ancient automobiles sit behind window glass, relics of the heavy metal era of auto production. There's a 64 Peugeot 404, given to Ho by French emigres living in New Caledonia. A 55 Gaz M20 Pobeda, given to him by his Soviet allies. And a stately 54 Zis 110, reputedly modeled on an old American Packard Super 8. Classics all, and a step above the Russian lot as our guides commandeered to shuttle us to the countryside in 1968. By night, Huan Kem Lake comes alive again, after the coma-like stupor of midday heat. Hundreds of pedestrians, mostly young, stroll along its banks in couples, families, and others, catching their breath in the ever so slightly cooler evening air. The traffic is no less torrid than at midday, 
as mopeds carry multiple passengers cruising the streets looking for action. My partner Joanne and I wend our way among the strollers, drinking in the heady brew of Hanoi's manic energy and pulsing heart. The great majority of those on these streets tonight know little or nothing about the war that killed so many in their grandparents' generation. Blessedly, they've known only peace, so they can afford the luxury of pursuing more ordinary obsessions. Cell phones, action, excitement, and searching for first love with that eternal heartburn of restless youth. Amid the throngs, we spot a circle of young people surrounding something or someone who's attracted their attention. We peer over their heads, and the circle obligingly opens to include us. In the center stands an old man with the wispy white beard of Uncle Ho, but he wears a broad-brimmed ten-gallon hat in the style of Indiana Jones or Crocodile Dundee. In one hand, he carries a fiddle. When he spots Joanne, he beckons to her to join him. He addresses her in halting but easily understandable English. Do you know your national anthem? He asks. Astonished at the question, Joanne responds. Why, yes, I do. Would you sing it with me? He asks her. As they begin to sing together, the circle draws closer and grows larger. Young people all, they listen raptly. My mind reels as I grapple with these ironies. I flash back half a century to my guide Du's baffling yet wise advice to learn to love my own people. How I'd struggled to do that. And yet somehow I succeeded, not by claiming our superiority, but by cherishing particular American people, places, and traditions, while treasuring others equally for their own unique gifts. And now, among a people who lost three million of their countrymen at the hands of my people, I hear our own national anthem, a hymn I haven't sung myself in ages, crooned by an old man with a distinct resemblance to Ho Chi Minh. Once again, I'm struck by the capacity of at least some Vietnamese to let go of the past, however horrific it may have been, to live in the present and for a future not yet born. I'm sure there are plenty of Vietnamese, as there are Americans, who still carry anger and bitterness about what happened during the American War. I've seen just a slice in time and place, then and now. But what a happier and more harmonious world this would be if, like many Vietnamese, we could release ourselves from the victim's grievance story and seize this moment as an open-hearted opportunity to begin again.
country.